Hello everyone, coming up next on We Talk Nerdy, my co-pilot and I are going to talk about the tech news of the week, we're going to answer an email about Blu-ray players, and we're going to talk about rooting your Android. So stay tuned! Right? We Talk Nerdy WeTalkNerdy.tv is sponsored by UBU Enterprises, specializing in custom business website design, social media marketing, and online branding strategies for companies and products. In this week's tech news, it was widely reported last week that an update to Windows, namely Windows 8.1, will include an option that will allow users to bypass the Metro Start screen and go directly to the desktop. Additionally, rumors surfaced that Microsoft is also considering bringing back the traditional start menu slash start button. If you watched the very first episode of We Talk Nerdy, you already know that you can bypass the Metro start screen with software from a company called WinArrow using their Skip Metro Suite software. You also know that you can put back the start menu uh, using Classic Shell. And I understand that Microsoft feels like they need to position Windows so that they can be a player in the mobile market. I get that. But I wonder if anyone at Microsoft is listening to the users who are saying, hey, I don't like this. Maybe they are. As usual, Microsoft's ham-fisted, tone-deaf approach to innovation is to force changes on their hapless users and then wait for pushback then they figure out what they need to fix. This is a perfect example of how Microsoft operates. They don't seem to understand that this alienates users and ultimately costs them, if not money, at least it costs them the goodwill of the users that they're trying to sell their products to. And I don't see that changing. Microsoft has done this for years. Maybe they'll learn their lesson, I don't know. Also in the news last week, Google Glasses are gradually finding their way uh, out of the lab and into the hands of actual users. There are a number of videos surfacing on YouTube uh, featuring videos taken with glass. Uh, my, my favorite so far is one of Alexander Chen playing the viola while wearing his Google Glass. There's a link to it on my website if you'd like to check it out. I'm looking forward to more of these glass videos. I, the images and the sound quality is really, really good, and I'm curious to see what people are going to do with it. Also last week, uh, Viacom uh, lost a lawsuit, sort of, against Google. Um, in 2007, Viacom sued YouTube uh, for copyright infringement for $1 billion. Viacom claimed that YouTube knowingly allowed infringing material to be uploaded to its site. In 2010, the courts ruled that YouTube was protected by what's called the Safe Harbor Clause of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Basically, uh, this clause stipulates that websites can't be held responsible for what their users do. Naturally, Viacom appealed that uh, 2007 ruling, and last year, the Second Circuit Court partially overturned it. Uh, Thursday, Judge Louis Stanton sided with YouTube. Uh, apparently, Viacom was unable to prove that YouTube employees failed to remove clips despite knowing that they were infringing. Viacom has promised to appeal again and again. This lawsuit has been going on for years and perhaps Viacom figures that the billion dollar payoff if they can convince a judge is worth it. And last but not least, the Twitter music service uh, launched last Thursday. Uh, you can reach it at music.twitter.com. And Twitter Music is a music discovery service that lets you listen to short snippets of about 30 seconds of music from various artists. Uh, Twitter ranks the music in several categories like most popular, emerging, now playing, which lets you listen to what your friends are listening to. And then they have suggestions specifically for you, which is based on music that you've tweeted about. Music for the service comes from iTunes, Spotify, or RDO. If you have a Spotify or RDO account, you can log in and listen to full tracks. The music service naturally makes it easy to tweet about whatever you're listening to or connect with others and explore what they're listening to. You can access the music service via the web, 
at the link I gave you earlier. There's also an iOS app and an Android app is supposedly in the works. Twitter music seems like a pretty cool way to listen and discover to music. Sorry, listen to and discover music. Uh, my only real objection is that you need an RDO or Spotify account to listen to full tracks. Uh, I don't find the experience of listening to 30 second segments particularly gratifying. Uh, and I personally don't have an RDO or Spotify account just yet. Um, so if you're looking for full tracks and you need a music discovery service, I can heartily recommend Pandora. I've been a Pandora user for years and it's really great. And with certain restrictions, it's completely free. There are limits to the amount of Pandora songs you can listen to uh, over the course of a month. But for the most part, those are very generous and most people I imagine use Pandora without paying uh, for Pandora One. All in all, Twitter music seems like a natural fit for Twitter and a good way for them to boost their bottom line. I've got an email this week from Eric M who writes, I have a Samsung NC10. I'd like to get an external Blu-ray DVD drive for it. Do you have any recommendations? I emailed Eric about his uh, situation and he indicated that his budget is about $100 and that the netbook is for his daughter and he's trying to avoid buying a tablet. Furthermore, he wants to be able to travel with this drive. I did a little research and I found a couple of options. There are a bunch of companies that make exter external optical drives and most of, the most of them power the drive using what is called a Y cable. Basically, it's a USB cable with two plugs. The reason for this is that the motor that spins the disc needs more power than can be provided by just one USB port. The bottom line is that long as you have two USB ports available, it should work okay. I note that the Samsung NC10 has three USB ports, so it should work just fine. Keep in mind that if your daughter is watching a movie on DVD or Blu-ray, it's going to use up the laptop battery pretty quickly. If you, keep the if you can keep the laptop plugged in, it should work really well. If you don't have one, you might want to consider picking up a power inverter for your car if you're going to keep her occupied while you're on the road. Cobra makes a number of power inverters that might work for you. The Cobra CPI 480 is a 400 watt inverter with two outlets and a USB output. It's less than $30 right now on Amazon, and 400 watts is more than enough to power your laptop and DVD drive. I have a Lighton DVD burner in my computer, and I'm very happy with it. Lighton and Samsung both make models in your price range that would get the job done that you want. You could consider this Lighton 6X USB combo drive for $70, or the Samsung SE506BB Blu-ray drive for $80. Now, I should say that I don't have any direct experience with either one of these models. I can generally recommend Lighton. I have one uh, of their drives in my computer and it works really well. Samsung also is a really trusted manufacturer of these kinds of products. Also, I recommend you order it from Amazon if you're looking for a good place to order on the internet. I use Amazon a lot and I recommend them without hesitation. Eric, thanks for the email. And remember folks, if you have a question, comment, or you just wanna talk nerdy, you can visit me at wetalknerdy.tv and leave a comment or email me here at wetalknerdy.tv at gmail.com. Now, I'd like to talk to you briefly about our sponsor, UBU Enterprises. Do you need a website for your small business? Maybe you need help managing your business's social media. UBU Enterprises can help you. They've helped me quite a bit. They took my ideas, they added in their own flair for design and execution, and they helped me to get my website exactly where it needed to be. I could not have done it without them, and the best part is they're still working with me to make sure that my site is running smoothly. Visit them at ubuenterprises.com. In this week's how-to segment, I'm going to tackle the thorny topic of how to root your Android device. 
Now, this is a difficult topic for me to cover because I can't give you exact step-by-step -step instructions. That's because the exact steps you need to take are different for different devices. However, what I can do is give you instructions on how the process works in a general way and where you can go for help with your specific device. Now, rooting your device should not be confused with jailbreaking. Jailbreaking applies to iOS devices from Apple and jailbreaking basically allows iOS users to install applications from sources other than Apple. I may discuss jailbreaking in more detail at another time, but for right now, I just wanna focus on rooting and Android devices. Now, let's talk again about what rooting your device means. I spoke about it briefly last week when I was talking about the Nexus 7. I thought I'd reiterate it here. As you may or may not know, Android is based on the Linux operating system. And just as in Linux, when you perform certain system operations, you need root permission. Root is the default name of the administrative account. So really, rooting your phone just means giving yourself permission to do things that are normally reserved for system administrators. Last week, when I talked about a USB on the go and how you can use a $2 cable to connect a flash memory stick to your Android, Android device and access the files on it. You can access and store movies, music, text files, or any other kind of file on a flash memory stick. This effectively increases the amount of storage you can have on your phone or tablet. In order to read, write to and from the memory stick, you need to attach it to your device and mount it as a volume. Mounting the volume just means that you're making the memory stick available to the operating system. Now, mounting a volume is an activity that requires system administrator privileges. That's why you need to root your device. Another good reason for you to root your device is so that you can take advantage of a great application called Titanium Backup. Titanium Backup is a very powerful and popular app from the Google Play Store, and it works with Android devices. With it, you can backup and restore apps and data on your device really simply and easily. I use it myself, and I highly recommend it. But in order to use it, your device needs to be rooted. Now, before we go any further, I need to caution you. There are two separate actions that many Android users take to mod their devices. The first is called unlocking the bootloader. The second is rooting. Unlocking the bootloader allows you to put custom software called ROMs on your Android device. This allows you to really customize many aspects of your Android hardware. Unlocking the bootloader may or may not be required to root your phone. If you do unlock the boat bootloader, be aware that doing so uh, will cause your device to reset itself to factory settings, wiping out all of your personal data. So before you back, before you uh, unlock the bootloader, make sure that you back up anything important. Again, this is not something you should do casually. Uh, if you don't follow instructions, you can brick your device. In other words, you can make it about as useful as a brick. If you're not sure you can do this kind of thing on your own, don't do it. I would consider rooting your phone or tablet an intermediate to advanced task. So if you're not comfortable with it, you might wanna find a friendly nerd to help you. Payment in cupcakes is often sufficient. Okay, so now that you know why you might wanna root your device, you need to work out how to do it. And this is the tricky part. There are a number of online resources from the Android forums at androidforums.com to YouTube to the XDA Developers Forum. I would encourage you to do a Google search as well. Just type in something like how to root whatever your name of your device is. Then read about what other people have done until you're comfortable that you understand the process. The XDA Developers Forum is probably one of the best places to start. Point your browser to forum.xda-developers.com and at the top of the window, there's a box where you can type in the name of your device. Note on some devices, it's important that you type in the name of your carrier as well. For example, 
My phone is a Samsung Galaxy Nexus and my carrier is Verizon. So I would type in Verizon Galaxy Nexus. This is important because the software on the Verizon Galaxy Nexus is different than the software on the Sprint now Galaxy Nexus, for example. They use different types of systems, so they have different types of software. The search box will direct you to the relevant forum for your device, and you should read the post there until you feel like you understand the process. Now, there are some toolkits available for some of the more popular devices. Toolkits make modding your device really easy, and if you can find a toolkit for your device, I highly recommend that you use it. It simplifies things dramatically. In many instances, it makes unlocking and rooting your device as simple as just clicking a couple of buttons. For example, here is the WUGS Nexus Toolkit. It can help you install drivers, backup and restore, as well as unlock and root your device. It can also restore your device back to factory settings uh, if you need to. For example, if you are going to sell your device, you might want to restore it to the factory settings first. That way, you're not selling your device to someone who can access your personal information. There are also more manual ways uh, of rooting your device if you can't find a toolkit. But I can't stress this strongly enough. I highly recommend that you locate a guide that was written specifically for your device and carrier and follow the directions step by step. Now, whether you're using a toolkit or following manual instructions, you're going to need to go to your device, open the settings menu, and go into the developer options and turn on USB debugging. Next, you'll need to connect your Android device to a desktop computer with a USB cable. When you attach your device to your desktop, you may discover that your desktop computer doesn't recognize your device. This means that you're going to need to find drivers so that your desktop computer can communicate with your device. If you're using a toolkit, it will probably help you locate the right drivers. Otherwise, you're going to need to consult your guide and download and install what you need manually. Once you have the driver situation sorted out and your desktop computer recognizes your Android device, you're ready to proceed. If you have a toolkit, you may be able to just go ahead and unlock and root the phone right there. Otherwise, your guide will explain how to download and use a couple of other pieces of software. You may need to download the Android SDK. You may need a program called ADB or Android Debug Bridge and another program called Fastboot. Your guide may also suggest downloading a program called Clockwork Mod as well. I highly recommend Clockwork Mod. It makes dealing with backing up your system and installing updates really, really easy. Again, the guide you're using will explain how to obtain these tools and how to use them. From this point, you'll use a command window and a combination of ADB and Fastboot to unlock your bootloader and root your phone. And I realize that I'm glossing over a number of critical steps here, but I repeat, you really need to locate a guide for your specific device and carrier. I can only give you a generalized idea of how it works because each device is going to be different. Once you've rooted your device, you'll be able to take advantage of titanium backup and you'll be able to mount flash memory sticks on your Android device. Now, once you've rooted your phone, you may run across a situation where you have the opportunity to update Android by downloading an update, uh, what they call over the air. Uh, this is OTA or over the air. And if your device is rooted, you need to take special precautions when you're applying an over the air update. You could brick your device or lose your root access if you don't do it in a correct way. Fortunately, there is a useful program that will help you solve this pro problem. It's called Voodoo OTA Root Keeper, and it's available free from the Google Play Store. Simply download, install, and run it. And when Root Keeper runs, you should see several options. If all is well, the first three boxes should be checked. Click the Protect Root 
button. And once all the boxes are checked, you're good to go. Now, at this point, I recommend that you back up any important information on your device using Titanium Backup or some other backup app. Or if you're using Clockwork Mod, you can boot into the recovery menu and do a backup from there. Once you've backed up your important data, you can go ahead and apply the update. In my case, the update failed. When my Nexus 7 rebooted Clockwork Mod, which I had installed when I rooted my device originally, it refused to apply the update. So I had to do a manual update. Now, I've been avoiding this update for a while, probably a few months, uh, mostly because I wanted to talk about it with you on the show here. Uh, that way I can explain it and kind of go through the problems. As a consequence, I actually had several updates which I would have needed to uh, have Several updates have sort of rolled out in the meantime. So I couldn't just update from the last version to the latest version because there were a couple of updates in between. So what I did was I went to my system settings to find out what version of Android I'm currently using. Under settings, about, I can see that I'm using build JRO03D. By doing a Google search, I was able to discover that the current build for my Android device, the Nexus 7, is build JDQ39. So I just did a Google search for JDQ39 from JRO03D. This brought me to a website I'm familiar with from earlier efforts to root my phone. It's called randomphantasmagoria.com. Great name, right? This website hosts updates for various phones and tablets, and since I've used it before, I was confident that downloading the update from this website would be safe. If you're not sure about the source of an update, you might want to check around by asking on some Android forums, or you could try and download the file directly from Google. Anyway, once I downloaded the appropriate update, I renamed it to update.zip, and using AirDroid, I copied the file to the SD SD card partition on my Nexus. Now, I talked about AirDroid before on episode five of We Talk Nerdy, uh, you, but you don't have to use AirDroid if you don't want to take the trouble to download it. You can just plug in your device to your computer using a USB cable and you can copy it that way. But you need to make sure you rename it to update.zip and you need to put it in the SD partition of your device. Now the Nexus 7 doesn't actually have an SD card, but it does have a partition that's named SD card, and that's where it would go. Now with the update copied onto my device, I use a nifty little program called ROM Manager to tell my Nexus 7 to reboot into recovery mode. You can also reboot into recovery mode by pressing the power, volume up, and volume down buttons simultaneously but that's only on the Nexus 7. Your Android device may require a different sequence of buttons, but nearly, as far as I know, all Android devices have a way of booting into the recovery uh, mode. Once you do it and you're in recovery mode, it's a simple matter to use Clockwork Mod to install the update. You just choose install update.zip from SD card, and if all goes well, your update will install and then you'll just have to reboot. Once, you, uh, once you're back up and running, you can use Voodoo OTA Root Keeper to recover your root access. And now I'm happy to report that I'm running the latest version of Android 4.2.2 Jelly Bean on my Nexus 7. In conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge again that I glossed over some of the steps for rooting an Android device, simply because there's no one way of doing it. My goal here was to give you a general idea of the steps required. And now that you've seen the reasons for rooting and you've gotten an idea of what's involved, I hope that you're better prepared uh, when you go to do it yourself. Well, that's it for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the show. I've been promising more Raspberry Pi stuff and I've kind of been putting it off. Uh, and if all goes well, I will deliver on that next week. I hope you'll tune in for that. And remember, if you have questions or problems and you need answers, visit us at wetalknerdy.tv and leave a comment or send us an email at wetalknerdy.tv at gmail.com. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next Monday.
Dit is zo'n smijzer.